right. Hey, guys, you may be seated. And uh, welcome, as Justin already kind of said to you, to One Life this morning. And uh, let me just say, I know it was already mentioned, but man, thank you so much, church, for all that you did to help us kind of just um, have an amazing day yesterday and invite so many folks into from our community um, to come and enjoy a day where we could just kind of, you know, give away some fun activities for families and, and food and all those kinds of things. <clears throat> I heard that those that were, <clears throat> excuse me, at our welcome tent, um, you know, as people were leaving and going back out to their cars, so many just said, man, thank you guys so much for doing this, you know. And so they, they felt like this was a gift to the community, and that's what we wanted it to be. And uh, so many of you, man, pitched in. Our teenagers, holy cow, I mean, good grief. So many of them showed up to help. I don't know what we would have done. Uh, we had a great group of young people helping out all day, young and old. I mean, we, we ran the spectrum, I mean, for sure. And so, man, all to the glory of God, right? We met before and said, why are we doing this? Man, this is so we can reach Ocala and in the name of Jesus would go out into this community and, and wherever God would take us. I mean, that's, that's what it's for, you know. And I hope anyone would know, uh, maybe if you're a guest with us today, just know we are not here to build a name for ourselves. That, that would amount to absolutely nothing of value. But hopefully you just heard us sing, man, worthy is the name of God, of Jesus, right? That's what it's about. And so, and that's what we're about, you know, and, and I kind of wanted to talk about that a little bit as we get into our study this morning. Um, we're going to be back in 2 Thessalonians, so if you have a Bible and want to go ahead and look for 2 Thessalonians, I would encourage you to do that. Um, but I wanted us to just kind of ponder, you know, like we've been studying through this little letter from Paul for several weeks now. And I wanted us to be reminded, like, why do we do that? You know, why do we come together in a room like this week in, week out, and, and just gather to hear and process the Word of God together? You know, and I know a lot of you know that, but I just thought it would be worth, like, remembering that I, I would say if you follow Jesus, I mean, you should have, and, and I think we have, generally speaking, a desire to be challenged by God through the preaching of his word to pray and think and live biblically, right? I mean, otherwise, why else are we coming in here, right? But, but we want to hear what God has to say week after week and time after time, and, and we dig in and process and spend time going through here because we really want God to change us and make us like Christ, and, and we want His Spirit to move us and empower us and embolden us, and, and so we want to hear these things, and so that's why we do that, right? Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58 uh, is a passage where Paul was writing to the church at Corinth, and, and he said this, and I think we may have ran into this verse a week or two ago. He said, therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, and this next phrase, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Right? That's what we want to do, and that's why we gather, and, and we hear God's word, and we process it together during the week, and we sort of challenge each other to put these things into practice so that we're always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing, of course, that your, your labor in the Lord is, is not in vain. And so this morning, the title of the message, I know a lot of you like to take notes, and if you're one of those people, uh, that, that, the title is that, Abounding in the Work of the Lord. Now, we're going to be in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, um, verses 1 to 5, and, and you won't find this phrase in this passage, but what Paul is going to do here in these few verses is sort of transition in this letter that he's writing and talk about the work of the Lord. And there are probably lots of ways to describe that. But we want to we be reminded, like, what is that so that we can lean in that direction with our lives? Because as, he, as we saw, what we want to do is be abounding in the work of the Lord, right? Your, your life is going to have more joy and more, you know, purpose and fulfillment and contentment as you're doing what God created you to do. And so we want to kind of see what some of those things are. Well, obviously, not everything today, but that's, that's what we want to be challenged by. Now... In this letter, and, and for those of you, maybe you're a guest with us for, for the very first time, let me just sort of catch you up what we've been looking at over the last few weeks. Um, Paul, the Apostle Paul, he wrote much of the New Testament, and he uh, wrote this letter to the church that was at, in Thessalonica, a city um, there not, not far from Greece and Turkey, kind of nestled in between little Asia there, uh, 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 an area called Asia, and so on. Um, but what he was doing when he wrote this letter is he wanted to assure them of the truth of the gospel 
um, and, and the things that he had already taught them. He went and visited this city and, you know, taught them a lot of things as, as they received Jesus as their Savior. And he taught them, and he, it was, some things he taught them were about the future, the things that were going to be coming. And, and then some folks came in behind him and were teaching some things contrary to what he had already taught them. And so he's wrote, writing this letter, and this is Second Thessalonians, because he wrote another one too. And what he's trying to do is just assure them that the things that they had been taught, man, they were right on. He got those from the Lord, and they could stand firm in their faith. And one of the ways that we've applied that to ourselves is to realize that there are a lot of things in this world that can kind of shake us, right? Uh, there's a lot going on, and, and life can be pretty crazy and, and unexpected. <clears throat> and so we go to the Word for the same reason that, that they did, right? To, to hear what God would have to say so we could kind of be calm and understand and be reminded who Jesus is in our lives. And we can also stand firm in our faith. So having sort of calmed their fears uh, and concerns about things that were coming and things that they were being taught, what Paul does now it, as he starts to kind of wrap up this, this short little letter is kind of recenter this group of, of believers on what they had been called to do. Like in the here and the now, you know, hey, it's good to think about things that are coming. And if those things are kind of disturbing you, let me settle your mind about some of those things. But God has called us to do some things right here and right now. And, and so uh, he says here, okay, finally, and, and he's going to talk about some really practical issues in their lives for here and now, and, and then some church issues. And next week, we'll see some of the things that were going on in that church that uh, we'll talk about and kind of apply to our lives as well. But what I want to share with you today then, out of these first five verses of 2 Thessalonians 3, are four things that I would say God does, right? In, in other words, these are the work of the Lord that we want to lean into. In other words, whatever God's doing, we want to be a part of that. We want to lean into that and make sure we're about or abounding in those things, right? So four things that God does, he wants to do in their lives and in our lives as well. That's the work of the Lord and how can we press into those things and be a part of whatever it is that God's doing. Because I can assure you this, whatever God's doing, you want to be a part of that. Because that's going to last, that's going to be good, that's going to be eternal, there's going to be fruit from that, right? We've probably all spent some time in our lives wasting time on things that weren't really of a whole lot of value, right? And, and so we want to visit these things here, and we're going to begin with the first one in verse, verse 1. And I'll just give you the point, and then we'll read the verse and, and kind of chat about it for a minute. Here's one of the things that God does, right? This is the work of the Lord that we want to be abounding in also. God wants to use us to spread the word of the Lord, to, to spread God's truth, right? He wants to use us to do that. Let's read verse 1, and we'll make a few comments, and then we'll move on. Here Paul says this, finally, brethren, right, I'm, I'm starting to wrap up this letter. Finally, pray for us that the word of the Lord may run swiftly and be glorified just as it is with you. Now, by the way, this whole little section is going to be kind of um, presented to us in an attitude of prayer. And you see here, uh, I, I, wasn't, I really struggled this week a little bit. You know, is this the work of the Lord, or is this just things we should be praying about? And the answer is yes, right? Both of those things are true. And he says, okay, finally, pray for us. We want the word of the Lord to go out from us, right? God using us to do that. By the way, I, I believe with everything in me that praying is the key to gospel effectiveness. Does that make sense? In other words, if we want to accomplish anything in the world for the Lord, it, it, with the Lord working through us, we need to be praying about those things, having God go before, because without him, we accomplish nothing. With him, all things are possible, the Bible says, right? But without God, um, it would be impossible for us to do anything of eternal value. And so Paul says, man, pray for us that the word of the Lord would run swiftly. Now, how does the word of the Lord, uh, let's say God's truth here, how does it get out? You know, how, does, how does it spread? How does it get to other people? How does it run swiftly? Well, the word of the Lord runs swiftly as you and I, those who know Jesus, as we share the word of the Lord with those around us, right? That's the only way that happens. It doesn't go by itself. In other words, God's plan was that his truth, his word, his gospel, his good news, his salvation would get to the people around us, our neighbors and the nations that, that would happen through us. Now, that means that the word of the Lord has to be in you if it's going to come out of you and spread to those around you, right? So I, I think it would be fair to say this way. The more saturated with God's truth, the Bible, your, His word, the more saturated with God's truth that you are, then the more that that goes out from you. 
And, and, and that happens incidentally. In other words, as, you, as you're just kind of going about life, man, the Bible's just coming out of your, your heart and your mind and, and the things, the conversations you have because you're saturated with that. If you're saturated with that, right? We talk about this all the time here, man. Just the importance of us as followers of Jesus spending time in his word. I mean, daily, regularly, all the time. Reading the Bible, listening to the Bible, praying about the Bible, sharing the Bible. Because God wants that to happen. It's his work. One of the things that God is doing in this world, and the question is, are we a part of that or are we not a part of that, is getting his word to the nations. That's the only message that really values, is valuable in this world, right? Is this one right here. There are a lot of messages being preached in the world, aren't there? All right, man, when, when we get into political season, which was just, this last week, you know, the voting and all that, and, and you know, in the next couple of years, we're going to be hearing about this, like, ad nauseum, right? I mean, just, just like, ugh, like, we get tired of that, right? Maybe it's part of life, maybe it has to be, but I'm just telling you, right here's the message that everybody really needs to hear. It doesn't matter if you're a Republican or Democrat or Independent or Libertarian, this is what the world needs, um, the rest of the stuff, it's, it's all secondary or tertiary or whatever the words are after that. I don't know what they would be. What people need is they need the gospel, right? It's going to go out through us. That's God's plan. So if you want to be a part of God's plan, abounding in the work of the Lord, then that's what we need to be doing, right? And it, it should happen just because we're so saturated with it. And it should happen intentionally, right? Like we do things on purpose to to inject God and his truth into conversation so people can come to know Jesus. Didn't that happen with you? I mean, didn't, didn't one day somebody on purpose, like, just start sharing the gospel and the truth with you or invite you to church or, or you know, help you through a situation, giving you the wisdom of God's word? So that's what Paul's saying here. Look, finally, guys, I need you to be praying about something. I need you to be praying that God's word would go out from us because we're, we're saturated with that in relationship with him. Now, Paul says this kind of uh, in a similar way to another church, Ephesians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20, I want to share that with you. It says this, and by the way, this is the context. Remember Ephesians chapter 6, it's talking about as Christians, we should put on the whole armor of God, right? And then toward the end of that, all these pieces of armor that he's describing, like faith and, you know, the helmet of salvation and our feet ready with the gospel and so on. And, and towards the end of that, he says, man, and praying always, you know, for all the saints. And then he says in verse 19, and... That means, and praying for me also, watch how Paul says this, that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that, it may be, that I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Now, let me ask you this question. How many of you in here would say, you know, I'm a follower of Jesus, and I really do want to be used of God you know, to get the gospel to other people. Anybody like that? Anybody in here would say, I know people that need Jesus, and I really would love to talk to them about that. Anybody in here feel like sometimes you're shy about that, or you don't know how to do that, or it's kind of a scary thing? Anybody like that, right? Guess what? You're in good company. Paul was the same way. Isn't that weird to think about? I mean, he's literally asking this church, hey guys, would you pray, would you pray for me that God would give me the words to say? Have you ever prayed that before? Man, I have so many times. Man, Lord, help me. I don't even, I don't even feel like I know what to say. I'm a, I've been a Christian for a long time. I've read the Bible a few times, right? And, and I still go, man, I'm not even sure. How do I even approach this conversation? How do I share this with this person? How do I share Jesus? What do they need? How, how do I go about this? And I get nervous and I get scared about that. And then I read the Bible and I go, oh, man, Paul was asking others, hey, pray for me. Help, help me. And then, look, that I might have boldness. Now, if it was me, I just would have thought Paul is just naturally bold. He just says it like it is. He's not the least bit afraid of anything. He's just, I mean, he was in prison for the gospel, right? So surely, but he's saying, man, I need you guys to pray for me, that, that I'll have boldness to, to make known the things the, of the gospel. And then I like how he says there toward the end, that I could speak boldly as I ought to speak, right? He knew, like we have this responsibility and we have this desire to share the gospel with others. We've got to be praying about that for one another, right? And asking others to pray for us. And sometimes we're nervous about doing that even, right? And here we see the example of Paul saying, man, just, just pray for me. Pray for us. We want the word of the Lord to go out. Pray that God would open doors and that he would give us boldness and he'd give us the words to speak. Now, going back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, or chapter 3. Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may run swiftly and be glorified just as it is with you. 
So when he says that the word of the Lord will be glorified, he's saying, really, he's wanting the gospel to be effective in the lives of people that he shares it with, right? Uh, he's saying the, the, the word of God is glorified as it accomplishes its purpose in the lives of people. Now, what would you say are the purposes of the word of God in people? I'm sure there are many, many answers. Let me just give you two words that I think kind of summarize what, what the purpose or objective of God's word into the lives of people are. One is salvation, and the second one is sanctification, right? Let me tell you, salvation, what do we mean? In other words, the word of God goes out. Of course, it includes this message. In fact, really, all of this points to this message of Jesus, that he came into this world as the son of God, and he lived a perfect life. And the reason he came, in fact, when he was introduced to the world by his cousin John the Baptist, he said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So he came to be the Savior of the world. Why did we all need, when I say the world, every individual human, why do we need to be saved? Saved from what? Saved from our sin. Because our sin is what condemns us and separates us from God. Anybody in here sinned ever, by the way? Okay, like, you need to raise your hand, right? You know, like... (laughs) Like, if you're breathing or you're awake, that's you, right? The scripture says, all have sinned and come short of what? The glory of God. How many? All. Every single one, right? Except the God-man, Jesus. He lived a perfect life. Now, he understands all of our temptations because he lived a human life just like us. And the scripture says he was tempted in every way just like we are, only without sin. And that's why we turn to him, right? Now... Because we're all sinners, that's really bad news. And it's bad news because the Bible says the wages of sin is what? Death. Death, Right? Death. So what we all deserve because of our sin, we're separated from God, and we we deserve and will receive death. That that death doesn't just mean physical death. That means spiritual death, eternal separation in a terrible place called hell from God forever. Right? That's the death that it's talking about. Really bad news. But the verse goes on. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is what? Eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So what the, that's called, this is the gospel. So Jesus came, and he lived a perfect life, and he died. He became the sacrifice for our sin. He paid our death penalty in our place. Who does that? Someone who really, really loves you more than you could possibly imagine. He died for you. So you don't have to die. Because, by, by the way, you're already spiritually dead. So what he wants to do is he wants to take this dead person, you and me, and make us alive through faith in Jesus. And that's, so, that's the, that, so he was the sacrifice for our sin. And, and so now, by faith, the scripture says, for example, Romans chapter 10, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. Saved from sin, saved from death, saved from hell. And brought into an, an eternal relationship with God. And you'll spend forever with him. That's the good news. That's the gospel. How was all that accomplished? Well, Jesus died on the cross to forgive us of our sins. Now, here's the thing. Just because he died on the cross doesn't mean that everyone is automatically forgiven, right? So how does someone actually receive the forgiveness, the gift that God is offering of eternal life? Well, it's it's by faith. Ephesians chapter 2, for by grace, free gift of God, are you saved through faith, believing in him, trusting in him, and that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. That's the good news, that God is offering salvation You know what it says in John 3, 16? To whoever believes in him will have eternal life. The word of God is meant to accomplish the salvation of every single human being who will simply trust that God loves them and died for them and rose again for them so that they could have eternal life. Listen, that's the greatest message that anyone could ever hear and receive. There's there's nothing better to talk about than that. And Paul's saying, guys, pray for us, that that we want the word of the Lord to go out from us and be glorified, accomplish salvation in the souls of those who will trust in him. But he also wants it to accomplish sanctification. Sanctification is the process by which once you accept Jesus, you just begin to grow and mature in him. God sends his spirit to live in you, and he takes his word, and he begins to transform you into a whole new being from the inside out, little by little, over time. That's called sanctification. That's what his word is supposed to do in us, right? So Paul's saying, just like it happened with you, we want this word to go out and affect the entire world. 
Therefore what? Therefore pray. We have to, we have to pray. When we pray, we align our hearts with what God wants to do, right? Um, so moving on here, I, I, I want to say this. I think that most of us in the room, if not all of us, I mean, we would say, if you know Jesus, we'd say, man, yes, I want that. I want to be used of God to take his word and the gospel to people and, and see them saved and sanctified and growing in him. I'd love to be a part of that work. One, man, let's pray to that end, right? Because I think we have that desire, but I think the problem is most of us aren't desperately praying in that direction. Does that make sense? Like, like wouldn't, if, is there anything more important than that? That God would use us to take his word of salvation to the world around us. Let's pray to that end. I guarantee you, if you're praying for God to open doors and give you boldness and the utterance so that you could speak the name of Jesus, do you know what's going to happen? God is going to open doors and give you boldness so you can speak the name of Jesus and the word of God is going to spread quickly from you. That's the work of the Lord. That's what we want to be a part of, abounding in that ministry. Let's pray to that end. So let's go on now to verses 2 and 3. So the work of the Lord is that um, God would use us, right, so that his word would go forth through us. But that's not all. It's also that God would protect us from evil. So Paul says this, watch this, and really in the same breath, he's saying, pray for us that the word of the Lord may run swiftly and be glorified just as it is with you. Verse 2 And that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for not all have faith. The reason people are unreasonable and wicked is because they don't have faith in Jesus. But he goes on, but the Lord is faithful, right? Not all people are, but the Lord is, who will establish you and guard you from the evil one. So part of what God does, his work in us and for us, is to protect us from unreasonable and wicked men and the evil one and we pray about this this is what paul's praying because we can't do that on our own right this is god's work so check this out while god wants to his word to go out into the the communities around us and to the world around us we also have an enemy satan who wants to hinder that very thing doesn't that make sense so if it's not going out it, there is a problem. You need to understand there is a battle because Satan wants the opposite of what uh, God desires. Now, the way that the enemy wants to hinder the word from going out is by hindering the messengers of, of the word, right, through which the word would go out. In other words, he's coming after you, and his desire is to keep you from spreading the word of the Lord and that the word of the Lord would run swiftly through you. That's Satan's desire. So how successful has he been? Right? Like, because it doesn't take a lot for us sometimes. It, right? I, I mean, for Paul, man, they had, to, they had to lock him up behind bars, chain him, to, chain him up, and whatever. But guess what? Did that stop him? No. You know, in the book of Philippians, Paul writes, man, I can't believe this. Here I am in prison, and, and now it's working out better for the gospel. Because now, like, the whole palace, like, I'm sharing with the guards, and they're getting frustrated with me, and they're telling Caesar, and they're telling all, the, all their bosses, like, this guy won't shut up. He just keeps talking about this guy named Jesus. What is the deal with him? And everyone was learning about Jesus. He said, this is crazy. Like, the gospel is now spreading more than it would have in that case. Even that wouldn't work. Why? Man, I think because Paul had given his life to the work of the Lord. He was abounding in the work of the Lord all the time. So, Satan uses unreasonable and wicked men to attempt to hold back the word of God from spreading through those who believe in him. When I was thinking about this, kind of thinking about Bible history, and thinking about the ways that Satan used wicked and unreasonable men, I thought about Pharaoh. Remember him? I mean, just enslaving God's people, killing their, their male children in an effort to just shut them down as a people. And of course, Satan was behind all that because he knew that the Messiah was going to come into the world through the, the nation of Israel. And you move forward in history, you come to the, really the New Testament. Herod did the exact same thing, had, you know, all these babies killed. Um, Pilate, obviously, being sort of a pawn of the enemy to crucify Jesus. Move on in history, you're going to run into men like Hitler and, you know, just so many others that, that the enemy was using to hinder the spread of the gospel, the thing is God turns all of that for good somehow. And, 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 and what you know, he thinks is going to shut that down, it ends up you know, multiplying even more as God's people are faithful to him. 
Um, so he does use wicked and unreasonable men. To, and so Paul's praying. Man, just pray that we would be delivered. Why? Man, so that the word of God could keep going out. You know, just pray for our protection. Um, Satan uses other people to do that. He also uses temptations and distractions in our lives. And I think for so many of us, this is really all it takes, you know. We, we, we don't need to be locked up anywhere. All he has to do is distract us. Do you think, do we live in a world of distractions? Oh, man. Like, they're, they're countless, right? More than ever, we can be entertained and distracted in so many ways. And, and all it does, I mean, if, if it just keeps us from doing and leaning into abounding in the work of the Lord, then he's been successful. And boy, he's really, really good at that, right? But the scripture says here, but God, man, he's faithful, right? The Lord is faithful. What God wants to do is establish you, strengthen you, man, just plant you firmly so you can continue to do what he's called you to do. And, and he will protect you as well so that you can continue to do the work of the Lord. That's, that's why we're here. And sometimes I think we forget that. By the way, so not, not only was Paul praying man, and, and asking for prayer that he would be protected and delivered from evil people so that the work of the Lord would continue. Um, and, and not only does he say, look, this is what God wants to do in you. This, this is the same kind of prayer that Jesus prayed. In John chapter 17. Maybe that's where Paul learned to pray this. John 17 verse 15. Remember Jesus. This is the longest prayer of Jesus in the Bible. It, almost the whole chapter of John 17. Jesus said this at one point. Um, I do not pray that you. Talking to his father. right? I do not pray that you should take them. The disciples out of the world. But that you should keep them from the evil one. Man isn't that exactly what he said here. Man, he's going to guard you from the evil one. Right. Jesus prayed the exact same thing for his disciples, and then for us as well. And Jesus taught us to pray the same way. Remember in Matthew chapter 6, something that we call the Lord's Prayer, probably a lot of you maybe throughout time somewhere had memorized this, right? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one, Right? And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And this was in response to the disciples going, hey, man, teach us how to pray. And Jesus said, hey, when you pray, pray like this. And, and so he's teaching them to pray the same thing. Um, by the way, when Paul says, and when we pray, hey, man, God, you know, please protect us from wicked and unreasonable people and evil people, it doesn't really mean that nothing bad is ever going to happen to you, right? That's, I mean, the disciples were, obviously, they didn't experience that. Paul like was imprisoned and you know but he still believed that all this was true so so what's the deal with that i think the deal is simply this like we're to abound in the work of the lord the work of the lord is that the word of god would go out and people would be saved and sanctified right that i mean that's primary to everything going on and god will protect us as long as he needs us here to do his work and then when he's done maybe it's time for us to go and paul said i have a desire to depart and be with christ that's far better in other words, we're only here for the reason to serve God, to abound in the work of the Lord. In the end, God wins every single time. And he protects us as long as we need to be here. By the way, this protection, it's not always, it's certainly not about just like our comfort. Like God, I mean, I don't know if this is good or bad news for you. God doesn't care about your comfort a ton. Like on the outside, physically, you know what I mean? He is the God of all comfort, so he wants to comfort your soul but com he can comfort your soul when you are afflicted on the outside. Does that make sense? That's more, like it's more important to God that he transform your heart. In fact, we're going to talk about that in just a minute. Then transform the external circumstances of your life so that you're comfortable. Like the, he's not trying to offer us that. He wants us to abound in the work of the Lord. That's where we're going to find worth and value is in Christ and doing the things that he has called us to do. So, but certainly we would pray for and, and we see Jesus modeled this, and Paul modeled this, and Jesus taught us to do this. Pray for protection so that we can abound in the work of the Lord and the, the word of the Lord can continue to go forth. This is what God does, and he wants to do that. So pray that way. Um, and then there's more. Um, he also does something else. This is what we're calling the work of the Lord. We're just seeing in this passage here. Verses, verse 4, he empowers us to walk in obedience. Empowers us. So... In Scripture, we're to abandon the work of the Lord. What is the work of the Lord? Well, the work of the Lord is to use us to get his word out. He protects us so we 
can keep working in the work of the Lord. He also empowers us to walk in obedience to him. Look at verse 4. He says, and we have confidence in the Lord concerning you. This is Paul talking to these believers. They were confused. He kind of settled them down. He says, now we have confidence in the Lord concerning you, both that you do and will do the things we command you. Now, really important to notice here. Where is Paul's confidence? His confidence is in the Lord, not in those believers, right? It's always, why? Because it's the work of the Lord that we're talking about, not the work of believers. Now, we work for the Lord. He's created us for good works, but the strength, the power, the wisdom to do any of that, it all comes from Him. So he says, so look, I'm confident that God is going to continue to work in you so that you'll keep doing the things that you're already doing in the name of the Lord. Obviously, in our own strength and power, we would quickly fall and fail. Um, I was thinking this week about Peter. Do you remember when, like, toward the end of, of <clears throat> Jesus' life, and his, he was with his disciples, and then they walked out, and sort of as he was, you know, getting ready to be captured and, and taken off to be crucified, remember what Peter said? Because Jesus was saying, man, they're coming to get me. And Peter was like, no way, Lord. Man, I will die for you. And he's pulling out his sword, and, and man, he's ready to go down, right? Man, I will, I will do anything to protect you. And so he declares, man, I'm ready to die for you. And Jesus kind of, I'm sure, shook his head a little bit and said, oh, Peter. <laughs> man, it's coming. In fact, he told Peter, the enemy has desired to sift you, right? I mean, he's coming after you. And, and you know what Jesus didn't say to him? He didn't say, but I'm going to make sure that doesn't happen. You know what he said? But I prayed for you. I prayed for you. So, like, this clash is coming between you and the enemy. Now, what he didn't say is, and you're going to lose, right? And he did lose. In fact, Peter, like, I mean, man, I think so highly of him in so many ways. He denied the Lord three times. Hey, you were with him, weren't you? Man, I don't even know who you're talking about. I mean, he started cursing, and they're like, like three times, just like, no, I don't know this guy. What are you talking about? Man, he'd walked with him for the last three years of his life. And, and, you know, if anybody, I mean, just a few chapters later in the Bible, I mean, you know, not long after Jesus' resurrection, man, Peter's preaching to thousands of people so boldly. But there was a moment, I mean, just days before where he's denying that he ever knew him even. Right? But God said, Jesus said, man, I prayed for you. And, and you're going to come back around. And when you repent and you're like, you, you get it together, man, you just wait and see what God is going to do in you. Um, but it's amazing how in our own strength, our own power, our own pride, boy, we can fall real quick, right? Be really careful. Doesn't the scripture say something about pride and falling and haughtiness and destruction and all those things, right, in Proverbs? Uh, if you don't know what I'm talking about, just go look it. Just, just go find it. Uh, it's not good. So Paul says, look, um, the Lord's going to help you. He's going to strengthen you. And we have confidence in him concerning you that you're going to do and keep doing the things that we command you. When he says command you, by the way, really kind of a strong military word. But what he's talking about is the, the, the revelation that God was giving them through the spirit and through the word. And his preaching and his writing, those are the things that really, they were commanding them, but not like, not like man to man, but from God through man to them, right? It's the revelation of God to them. And, and so Paul says, look, we're, we're giving you some things, but we believe and have confidence that God wants to continue to do that work in you. So you are faithful so that, so that the word of the Lord continues to go out. Um, and I think we have to recognize we have a responsibility to obey what God says, like to do and to keep doing the things that he has planned for us to do. Uh, that's part of the life that we live. It's not enough to simply know the truth. We have to put the truth into practice. And really, that's all part of the discipleship process, right? Around here, we'll say um, that, you know, we exist to make disciples, glorify God by making disciples. We say that love and grow and serve comes right out of Matthew chapter 28. Right? Now, what did Jesus say in Matthew? Man, we're supposed to go out and make disciples of all nations, baptizing those that believe. And then we teach those that believe and are baptized to observe all the things that Jesus had commanded. Uh, I remember Justin and I having a conversation a ways back. And he said, man, have you ever noticed? It doesn't say just teach them the commands of Jesus. It says teach them to observe the commands of Jesus. And we're teaching people to obey the word. 
We model that, we teach that, we walk alongside one another to help each other put into practice. And the scripture teaches that the Lord empowers us to walk in obedience to him. The strength, the power, the ability to, to put into practice what God says and to keep doing those things, it all comes from him, right? Anybody ever in your life, when you look back as a Christian, you were walking really well, but there was a season in your life where, man, you kind of hit a wall, you fell into a hole, and, and there was this kind of a, a season where you slid back somewhere, you, you just, you know, you kind of walked out of fellowship with the Lord and other believers. I mean, things were going so well, but then they weren't. And I think that's why he says, look, it's not, you're doing the right things, but we've got to focus on continuing to do the right things day after day, time after time. In the strength and power of the Lord. Um, and the reason we pray about that is because on our own, man, we would fail. But with him in us, do what the scripture say? It, who, if he's for you, then who can be against you, right? In him, you can do everything that God has called you to do. And part of the work of the Lord is to empower you to walk in obedience. Let me give you the last one here. It's in verse 5. What is the work of the Lord? It's to use you, protect you, empower you but then also to transform your heart. This is what he says in verse 5. Look what he says. Now, and again, it's here it's just all prayer, right? It's just an attitude of prayer. Now, may the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patience of Christ. He, he's essentially just praying, man, this is what I desire that God would do for you. And it's what God wants to do. Direct your hearts. That word direct, it means to guide. It also means to, to straighten. Fully. And I was thinking about both of those words, and I thought how appropriate they are for our hearts, right? Our hearts need to be guided. Oftentimes, because we're just lost, right? We're just wandering around, and we need someone, we need a guide to come alongside, and that's what the shepherd does, right? Jesus comes in and gets a hold of our hearts, and he saves us and begins to direct us in the way that we should go. But then also, it, it means to straighten something out. And how easily our hearts get twisted and turned and perverted and pointed in the wrong direction. And what God comes, and he, it's, it's his work, right? He just begins to straighten that and make that something that's useful again. And, and his specific prayer is that God would direct our hearts in two directions. He said, into the love of God and then into the patience of Christ. And when you think about the love of God, I think, man, everything really goes back to that. In fact, remember the, the first and great commandment of all the commandments in Scripture? What is it? Matthew 22. That you would love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's the first and great commandment, right? Now, there's another one. The second one, it's like it. What's that one? To love your neighbor as yourself, right? By the way, fall festival yesterday, that, that was the idea. Man, we just want to love our neighbors. Say, hey, man, we're here. Jesus is here, and, and we want you to see him and know him love God it all starts there by the way scripture says this we love God because he first what loved us right we don't go searching for God he comes searching for us if and when we search for God it's because God's already drawing right spirits are already at work we talked about that last week spirit working to draw us to himself and and part of what God does is he transforms our hearts so that we're, we're pointed in the direction of loving God all right and growing continue to grow in that direction. Now may the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God. You know what Jesus said? The way that people are going to know you're my disciples is by the love that you have for one another. So you love God and then you love the people around you. Man, this is characteristic of who God is. For God is love. That's why we talk about it all the time. Making disciples that love. And that's the work of God. Is he shaping us and transforming and directing our hearts in that direction? But he also says this. Now, may the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patience of Christ. Man, how many of you are like pros, just experts at patience, right? Maybe some of you. By the way, on the parking lot yesterday, I saw a few kids. The Man, they were struggling with patience. I saw a few parents struggling with patience as well. I remember this one kid yesterday, it was funny, I was working the, the train area over here, and, um, and this kid, it was so funny, like, everybody loaded up, and then, but he didn't get to get on the train yet, so he, he was the first one in line, he had to wait for it to go around, and man, that thing took off, and that kid, he comes over and kind of taps on me, he goes, hey, you know what, I mean, this, this dude was this tall, I mean, you know, but his English is pretty good, I mean, he, he, like, it was all coming out, but he, like, so he, I don't know, he, he couldn't have been more than four or five, and he said, man, you know what, he goes, it's going to it's going to take forever for that train to get back here. 
because because last time when I was standing here it was like five or ten minutes you know and so like forever and five and ten minutes that's all the same thing in a kid's mind you know it's just forever but he actually did really well because there were some others that like, they just totally melted down train drove off they didn't get on it yet and you know life was over and man it, it was crazy but the reality is that's just a picture of all of us isn't it I mean I've seen adults melt you know maybe not in the same way but just lacking the patience of Christ. And boy, we all need help in that way. And so Paul, he's saying, guys, man, this is what I hope. I'm asking God, this is what I want him to do in you is direct your hearts, because it's what he wants to do, into the patience of Christ. One of my favorite def definitions of patience is this. Um, might surprise you a little bit. Cheerful endurance. Ooh, isn't that good? Patience, like sometimes I've, I've, I've probably said or somebody said to you, uh, oh, thank you for your patience. When in fact, they don't know if you're really patient or not. Like you had to wait because it didn't matter, right? But inside, man, you were seething, you were boiling, you were upset, you were like going crazy, right? Um, cheerful endurance. That puts patience into a whole new arena that we probably should be thinking about. The reason we should think about it is because that's the kind of life, that's the kind of patience that Jesus had. And so that's why he says the patience of Christ, um, the joy, look, Hebrews chapter 12, it, you're, you're really close there, just flip to the right a little bit if you got your Bible. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, talks about this kind of patience, and it says this, Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, and he's referring to chapter 11, all these people throughout history who followed after God, and kind of gave us an example. He said, we got all these people, man, they're just watching us, and, and they're cheering us on. And he said, knowing that, having that in mind, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us the the race of your life is not easy it's not going to be easy god never says it's going to be easy in fact he says the opposite is going to be hard because we live in a sin affected and fallen world but jesus will never leave you nor forsake you if he's your savior right and he will take you to the end but watch what he goes and says next so let us run with endurance the race that is set before us verse 2 Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So Jesus, in his lifetime, he knows the cross is coming. This is the worst thing that's ever happened in human history, is that humans killed the Son of God. And Jesus knew it was coming. It was part of God's plan to save us. And it was just horrendous. How could he do that? The scripture says he did it because he was looking at the joy that was on the other side of the cross. And what an incredible example for us. I mean, he's cheerfully enduring the worst thing ever because he knew that through the cross, people were going to come to faith in him. Their sins would be forgiven and they would spend eternity with him. And so he despised the shame of that. So I'm going to do that because there's something on the other side of that. And isn't that how we should live our lives? Man, we go through this life. It's hard. Unimaginable things are happening to us. But what should be happening is that with cheerful endurance, we're saying, look, I'm just being used by God to take his word to the nations. But there's something on the other side of this. And it's heaven. It's eternity. It's fellowship with God and Jesus and all those who have gone before me. That's what I'm living for. That's what motivates me. That's why I keep going. And in the power and strength of Jesus, I can do all that he's called me to do. Amen? That's the life he's called us to. And so I say, man, let's do that. Let's help each other. Let's challenge one another. Let, let's interact. Let's push each other to walk in conformity with what God says. Because it's not easy and it's hard. We all fail and we all fall. Right? Not, not one of us does that perfectly. Not even close. And that's why we gather. That's why we're here. That's why we pray. So we say, God, help us. We need you. You can do this. We want to do this. But, God, we're praying that you would help us. And that's what Paul was doing here with these guys. He's saying, guys, I'm praying for you. I want you to pray for me. We have confidence in Jesus. We're going to keep charging after him. Listen, life is hard. Um, I was thinking this week. You can't control every situation. But you can control your response to every situation. And that happens as your heart is transformed by the Lord, directed into the love of God and into the patience 
of Christ. It's the only way that that will happen. Not in the flesh, but in the spirit. And this is the work of the Lord in his spirit and his word. All of this couched in the language of prayer. And, and so I think what that means is that's how we need to be praying. Right, guys? We need to be praying this way. What should we be praying? For God to use us to spread his word. To take the good news to our neighbors, to our family, to our friends, to the world. Wherever, wherever he would take us. Pray that God would use us. Pray that God would protect us from evil. Not just, from, not, not just so we'd be comfortable, but so that he's glorified in our lives. Pray for the power of God to empower you. Empower me. Please pray for me this way. To empower me to walk in obedience to his word. And then let's pray for God to transform hearts, starting with my own. And then transform the hearts of those who don't yet know Jesus. Because that's really where transformation begins, right? Is with a personal faith relationship with Christ. So as we, as we wrap up today, man, I want to pray with you. I want to pray for you. And I'm, I'm begging you to pray for me. And let's pray for our community that God would use us to take his good news to the world around us. But maybe you walked in here today and, and, and you're hearing some of this kind of for the first time going, whoa, man, this is crazy. You guys are serious about this. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, transformation begins with Jesus. And so the question I would have is, have you ever given your life to him? Right? And the reason I say it that way, sometimes we say, oh, do you believe in God? Oh, yeah, I believe in God. Do you believe in Jesus? Oh, yeah, I believe in Jesus. I've always believed in Jesus. Guess what? So have I. I mean, that's what I was taught from a little guy, right? But there came a moment in my life where I realized what Jesus did on the cross for me, and I stepped into that by faith and said, okay, man, uh, God, I don't know what this is going to look like, but if you've got life for me, then I'm accepting your gift, turning away from my sin, and, and I'm just here to follow you wherever that takes me, right? That, that's 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 faith, that's trust, that's belief, that's embracing, that's giving your life to him. Has there been a moment in your life where you trusted God by faith? Ask Jesus to come into your life and forgive you your sin. And the scripture says, if so, man, he comes in and, and saves you and gives you eternal life. If you've never done that, then we're going to conclude in prayer. And I'm just going to encourage you, have that conversation with God. Man, I don't know how to do that. Man, just talk to him. Admit, man, you're a sinner. You're separated from him. You understand that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Thank him for sending Jesus. Ask him to come into your life and forgive you and just say, hey, I'm here to follow you. Whatever that looks like, it scares me to death because I've never done this before, but I'm ready to follow Jesus. Listen, if you haven't, like that would be the best decision you could possibly make in your eternity. <laughs> and it's a game changer, right? And man, I've, maybe that's why you're here today. And maybe for those of you who would say, man, I, I trusted Jesus a long time ago or it was last week or whenever it was. Listen, let's pray and ask him to continue the work of sanctifying, changing us, making us more like Christ, washing us with the, the, the renewing of the word of God, making us more and more like him so that we can walk in his strength, his power, to his glory, and see him do great and mighty things. Do you want to see God do great and mighty things? You want to be a part of that? Well, then let's pray to that end. Can we do that? Let's close in prayer today. Father in heaven, thank you so much for your goodness, for your word, for your truth, for your spirit. Lord, thank you for the body of Christ, for people who come and want to hear your word and grow in you. They want to work for you. Lord, understanding that we're called to grace, we're called, um, you know, to trust Jesus by faith, to receive eternal life, and then just to follow after you. The scripture says that once we accept Jesus as our Savior, you have prepared so many good things for us to do so that others would not see us, but they would see you working in us and through us and glorify the name of Jesus. And so, God, today we're coming to pray that you would use us in these ways. Lord, we could give testimony of the many ways that we fail and that we fall, but that you are faithful and that you are good all the time. So, Lord, help us and strengthen us and empower us. Lord, I, I, I don't want to leave without just asking that if there's someone in the room that doesn't yet know Christ personally, that right now they would just take a moment to confess Jesus as Lord, to trust him with their eternity, to turn away from their sin, and embrace the love that you are offering to them through the cross of Jesus Christ. 
And Lord, may they know that we're here to help and to walk the road with them. That so many in the room, man, we can go back to a moment in our lives where, where you came in and you changed us. And you made us a new creation. And it was like we were just born into your family, born brand new, and, and began to grow from that very moment. Um, man, thank you. Thank you for the gift of life and salvation. Father, you're so good to us. We pray that you'd take us forth from here. Lord, that, that you'd give us boldness and you'd give us the words to speak as we ought to speak so that Jesus would be glorified. Man, you're so good to us. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen.